So, Berto, this is part two in which we talk about the psychology of John Lennon's murderer. I don't know what I'm going to call this episode, but I thought this was going to be one whole episode, but then I got almost all the way done with it. And then I thought, no, this has to be two parts. So we're actually, I'm actually going, this is later. I'm recording the intro later. So yeah. if I refer to this late, if later on in this episode, <laughs> if I refer to this as one episode, it's because I didn't know at the time it was going to be two episodes. Let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. My name is Umberto Castaneda and I manufacture eraser heads. So the assassination the individual is 25 years old. It's October of 1980. Did you realize he was only 25, Berto? No. Just the thought. If you had asked me randomly, yeah, if you had asked me randomly, like how old, I'd be like, I don't know, like 30 something. Yeah. I mean, 25. It's very young. A very yeah. young, young man yeah. with the prime of his life. And um, he's wanting to kill. So uh, October 1980, he buys a gun and he's going to kill John Lennon flies to Hawaii from near to, uh, from Hawaii to New York City and he lands and he's walking around New York City he you know knows where John Lennon lives and because it was a famous knowledge bit and he says in an interview later that he was frightened that people would figure out his secret mm. which is a sign of psychosis hard to know I mean because sometimes when you're up to no good you're kind of like can people tell, you know, like you're high on pot or something? So another little sign of psychosis, another sign that maybe people would reading his mind, that kind of. So this, this is an odd one that I can sort of relate to in this weird way. Um, and maybe it is, it stems from that narcissistic thing. Like I had this all my life. I still do, but way more attenuated. I would go to a public place or a party or something and a lot, a lot of me felt like everyone was watching me. And everyone was watching every move I was making. And not in a good way. Not like, oh, look at how... No, it was like, oh, God, I'm being judged mm. constantly. Mm. Everyone is watching me. This is super uncomfortable. Um, that feeling it was very recurring. For example, I would go to parties at my grandma's house, Liti's, and all these adults, you know, tons of adults, maybe a couple kids, but mostly adults, and I would just feel so uncomfortable, like everyone was judging me. And now that I'm talking about it, I wonder if there wasn't this subconscious, like, I'm just making this up on the spot, but it was like maybe a subconscious, like, oh, do they know the whole story? Like with my mom and my dad, like, do they know everything? Are they going to judge me? You know, it, maybe, but whatever the reason was, I always felt like, oh gosh, I'm just being judged. I feel so... Like, I probably look awkward. Like, what I'm wearing is probably not right. Like, all these weird things. And this wasn't even anything of consequence. Just a freaking party at some, you know, like. Um, and and I these would, are I, family members that you knew really well. It wasn't just strangers. Many of them. Uh, a lot of them are just, uh, they're friends and adults and stuff. But, like, no one's watching. And it's just, there's a kid. He's in, in and out of the room and barely notice. Um, and then I'd be in public places and I would feel that too, like. Just like all eyes on me, gosh, I, I wonder if I, I look weird. Maybe this shirt just doesn't work well. Like just weird obsessions like that in my head that would be me feeling like the world was watching me and judging me. Hmm. Interesting. And so it, when you said that, it felt a little familiar. Like, yeah. do they know? Yeah. Do they know I'm about to do this terrible thing? Right. Did you know that he had other people on his list of possible targets besides no, John I Lennon? No, I did not know. Yeah, he had Paul McCartney on oh, his list if geez. he couldn't if he couldn't get John. He had Walter Cronkite. He had Johnny what? Carson. Yeah, Johnny Carson. Okay. George C. 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 Scott, the actor. Wow. I'm not, I'm not sure why he would have maybe from Doctor Strangelove. I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, and George C. Scott was in a play in New York, Broadway, and he had a plan that he would go to the play and shoot. George C. Scott oh from gosh. from the crowd while he's on stage. <coughs> while he's on stage, Jackie Onassis, Marlon Brando, President Ronald Reagan. Wow, David Bowie apparently was second on his list. And I mean, he was gonna do it no matter what. He was gonna do something. Right. I mean, who knows? Hard to know. But um, 
which is interesting because you know the narrative up until this point is John, 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 right? But then we yeah. learn that he had this list of all these other people, and he uh, had. And Bowie was apparently second on the list, and Bowie was also in a Broadway play that very next night on December 9th. Oh my god. Dude, imagine if you find this out as one of these people. Because it's one thing, you know, famous people probably always on some amount of alert. They've, yeah, but not someone that actually targets. goes through with it. Yeah, Right. Like, to know that, oh, no, no, this isn't some hypothetical. They killed someone that was on their list, and I was on their list. Yeah. Well, Bowie said in an interview uh, soon after, Chapman had a front row ticket to the Elephant Man the next night, which is what Bowie was in. John and Yoko were supposed to sit front row that show as well. So the murderer, John and Yoko, all had front row tickets. Oh, my God. So, so Bowie goes on to say, So the night after John was killed, there were three empty seats in the front row. I can't oh. tell you how difficult that was to go on that night. Oh, my God. That's so insane. Yeah. John so, Lennon might have watched David Bowie be killed. Or he would have killed John and Bowie at the same time. You yeah. Know? It's, uh, who knows? But, um, oh, so the murderer said that he was just looking to kill a famous person and that he chose John Lennon out of convenience because it was known that John was easily accessible from the, from the streets of New York City. Um, he also says in an interview, I don't know why I chose him. But I was just fed up with the world. So there's that. I'm fed up with the world. And I thought if I murdered this guy, then it would be all over for me. It would kind of be a solution in a way. The self-destruction would be a blessing. Holden knew he was against phoniness. So again, there's that Holden Caulfield identification yeah. and this fed up with the world. And when, when you hear this... It, a lot of these mass murderers will say things like this. It just it's just like it just felt like a solution. It felt like something to do. It felt like it would it would make it right okay. if I just killed this person. It would solve my problems. You know, of course it didn't and it doesn't ever, but that's the way it feels. It just feels like if I just do it then maybe I'll feel better. You know, because for you know, and I often will uh, draw this analogy which is when someone decides, you know, when Lady Gaga decides to wear a meat dress, people don't make documentaries about what was going through her mind that night before she wore the meat dress. You're just like, well, that's weird. You know, it's an odd human behavior, but whatever. I don't really care why she did that. But when it comes to murder and these kinds of crimes, we will obsess over why. Why did it happen? Well, we don't know why anyone does anything. We don't know why Lady Gaga wore a meat dress. We don't know why Kid Rock wrote that stupid song. And we definitely don't know why this guy killed John Lennon. You're like, we have ideas and hopes that we can somehow explain it because it makes us feel like we have some control over the world, some predictability of the world, but we don't. And it's like, you know, with this individual, the murderer, why did he decide to join the YMCA? Why did he decide to travel the world? Um, why did he decide to kill himself? These are unknown answers. We don't know. Uh, I think he was trying, I think he was basically suffering and trying to turn over any rock to see if it would work. That's, that, that's what seems apparent to me. Like, yeah. I'm going to become a hippie. I'm going to become a, you know, evangelist. I'm going to uh, go to seminary. I'm going to become a YMCA person. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, and he just keeps overturning rocks and then if, and he's really he's building anger and then and then another rock that was left unturned was well i'm going to kill a famous person it just occurred to him and he was going to see if it would help if it would yeah. end his suffering and of course you know it doesn't but um i think that's the theme i don't know am i making sense bro yeah yeah no i think that's that is unfortunately what it looks like it's we will keep trying to see if we can be happy and it seems like we're not happy and maybe this last Hurrah is the only thing I can do. Right. When you're it's it's sort of like when you have a an unknown medical problem, like right. pain or fatigue or some something, something's happening, allergies and you're like, "Well, maybe if I cut out milk or maybe if I do this or maybe if I take this drug." And you just you just keep turning over rocks, of course, because you're looking for an answer. And when you have 
the amount of deep suffering that this individual had, um, and you've tried a lot of things, then there's a small chance that you'll become locked in on murder as a solution. Maybe if I, hmm. maybe if I murder my parents, or I murder a famous person, or I murder yeah. people at school, or I show those phonies or that bully who's who's who, right. uh, maybe then that will make me feel better. Again, it's not a frequent solution that's a, yeah. that occurs to people, but it occurs enough that we see the result in our society. He also says, I decided to kill John Lennon to make others aware of Catcher in the Rye. If you read the book, you would see that I am the Catcher in the Rye of this generation. Jeez. End quote. So what do you hear in that quote, bro? Oh my gosh. That's that kind of super grandiose thinking and right. um, the need for... Okay, so it goes back to the little people that adored him, the the kids that adored him, uh, he literally now is saying, yeah, I'm saving the kids out there. I am that person for real. Yeah, I'm saving them from phoniness. I'm going to kill one of the phonies, which will save the entire world and all the children. It's like, huh? <laughs> right, who no longer even know who John Lennon is, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, my gosh. Another thing he so talked sad. about, during this time was that he thought John knew and accepted his fate um, in his lyrics. And when he, cause he, I'll describe oh, later, see. he met John in person, you know, when just before he killed him and he thought it was his destiny to kill John. And he thought that John accepted that destiny. Right. And even later when he was in prison, he still adhered to that belief that some so that that lends itself either to towards a really grandiose idea of his place or mild psychosis which yeah right. which seems possible um so in summary what we see here is that he's starting to lose touch with reality because it's one thing to search for happiness in church or with hippies it's another thing to search for a solution in murdering John Lennon, right? It, we're yeah. starting to see him, and this is common if you do have psychosis for it to escalate in your mid twenties. I don't know if that's the case, but there seem to be some um, some signs there. Okay, so he tr apparently he tried to buy ammunition in New York City, um, but he couldn't, uh, according to him. And but I don't really understand that. It's like why couldn't you buy ammunition like they wouldn't let him it, maybe it was licensed in new york city in a certain mm -hmm. way i'm not sure um he reportedly watched the film ordinary people you know with timothy hutton oh, mary yeah. tyler moore donald sutherland jed hirsch from taxis the therapist and you know it's a story about a depressed kid who has a complicated relationship with his family he has a therapist um and apparently this movie heavily influenced the individual to not kill John Lennon. And so wow. he returned He returned home. And in addition, to, he was having trouble getting ammunition. So this shows that he's on the fence. You know, there's a part right. of him that wants to do it, and there's a part of him that doesn't want to do it. And according and, to his and wife... And was susceptible to, to intervention, potentially. Exactly, as a lot of these cases are, you know. Yeah. One of the things that they teach us and research shows is that with suicide or homicidal thoughts, it is often a fleeting thing and often people are reaching out for help there they give mm. signals like this is what's happening essentially like please take note of this along those lines his wife gloria uh, when he returned he confessed his plan to his wife uh, she says quote he said that my love saved him he even had me hold the gun which was still cold from being in the plane's cargo hold he said he threw the gun into the ocean and I believed him but he mm. had lied to me uh, by the way it should be noted she did not inform the police or mental health services which could be argued as a as a massive neglect <laughs> like, he oh, he wasn't just talking about killing John Lennon he flew to New York City <laughs> to kill him with the sole purpose of killing him I don't know you probably yeah, no, should call the psychiatrist or someone, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's such a hard thing because um, remember we did that episode about the, the couple where the girl went missing on the road trip and then 
yeah, later. Uh, guy just Gabby went. Petito. And, and I was upset because I was saying, dude, those cops should have done more, blah, blah, blah. The thing is, it's so hard to know in the moment. So, Well, there was no, you, to be clear, there was no indication of homicidal intent from that stop. I uh, mean, I don't know. Like, we can relitigate it. But there, <laughs> it was, well, we can relitigate it, that, but I think it's important to point out that the the report that they had from the couple was she was violent with him only, and they never had any report of him being violent with her. Um, that's in that's either what case, they heard. Yeah, but that's I mean, quite a big that's quite a big difference. Then my husband flew back from New York City, saying he flew there with the sole intention of killing John Lennon. You know, it's it, it's a it's no, a I know. But my gap. point is, like, you know, imagine your son does this, comes back. And you're horrified. You're like, oh my God. Okay, okay, well, we'll get you help or something. Like, I'm so glad you didn't go through this. You know, totally. Yeah. It, there might be many parents that don't, that their next move isn't to call the authorities, which I would never do because I understand how the system right. works. Of I don't, I, because same with uh, me. <laughs> people have a stereotype of the system, so to speak, yeah. the, the system. And they believe that you know one report means lock them up forever which is just yeah. not the case right. and so um you know yeah by the way suicide homicide always tell someone <laughs> tell at the very least anonymously call a hotline and say so if i had a friend <laughs> you know um, yeah i mean like look i would i have done something absolutely it, it, whether it's my my child my grandpa my dad like of course because <laughs> That is just like, at that point, you've crossed so many state lines, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not entirely shocked that someone who loves him, who was like in an, in, probably, who knows, but probably dysfunctional relationship to start with. But yeah. in either case, it's just not that surprising. No, no, so. I'm not surprised uh, at yeah. all. I would yeah. guess 99% of people in her position would have done the same thing. Yeah. But it's upsetting to think about, is it not, that she could have yeah. called a psychiatrist. Absolutely. And at the very least, yeah. a psychiatrist could have reached out to him and said, hey, how about you come back and let's talk about this. Yeah, and That could have completely ended the whole thing. You know, yeah. um, you wouldn't have to call the police. You wouldn't have to call John or even just, hey, um, psychiatrist, could you maybe reach out to John Lennon's people and just tell them to F -Y -I. watch? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you get, you get them through a few months. You get this individual just to back off of this idea for a few months and, you know, maybe. Um, maybe. It's not inevitable is the thing, uh, according to research, suicide and homicide. Yeah. It's not one of those things like, well, they're going to do it. They're going to do it eventually. It's like, no, if you get them through the hard times, they often emerge on their side um, with no motivation to do it. Okay. So a month or, two, month or two goes by, I think about a month, and it's early December, December 6, 1980, flies back to New York to kill John Lennon. He said he was very confused at the time, and he was living inside Catcher in the Rye. So this lends itself to psychosis. And in New York City, he vacillated between suicide, going home, and killing John, he says. He bought another copy of Catcher in the, in the Rye and wrote in it, this is my statement, meaning that he would give this to the, uh, the police as a statement after killing John. Mm. A couple days later, December 8th, uh, he goes to the Dakota where um, other fans might wait to see if John will come out of the building because he often, he'd just walk out and walk around the street. And he's there in the morning and he sees John and Yoko leave in the morning because they were recording that day at Record Plant Studio, which is in Manhattan. And um, they, let's see, Mark walked up to John and handed him his new album, Dub Double Fantasy. And he didn't say anything. He just like handed him the album. And wait, it was, wait. It, Mark handed the album to John. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, John, Mark didn't say anything. He just was like, mm, you know, silently. Yeah. <laughs> and John looks up to him and was like, do you want me to sign it? <laughs> and the killer said, yes. And so John signs it. And at this moment, a photographer takes a photo who he's a professional photographer, but he just wanted to get a couple shots of John, I guess kind of like an early paparazzi in a sense. Yeah. And he takes a photo and there's a photograph 
of John signing the album with know, the killer. So ridiculous, right and tragic. There. Yeah, and the, John hands it back to him, looks at the killer, and says, "Do you want anything else?" <laughs> and the killer is convinced in this moment that John knew that he was going to kill him. He's like, "Oh, he knows." Do you know? He's like, basically in a coded sense, yeah. saying, "Are you? Is this when you're going to kill me? Because uh, do you want me to wait here so you can shoot me?" That kind of thing. Um, John and Yoko get in their limo. They go to the studio and they record. Do you know what song they were recording? No. When a Yoko song, Walking on Thin Ice. Have you heard this song? I don't know if I have. It's not Is bad. It on which, which album? It, well, it, it, they had oh, just never released heard. Double Fantasy. Yeah, yeah, okay. it, it was a single um, actually a month later, after oh, a couple okay. of months later. So it was like, I don't know if it was planned to be, but I think after John was murdered, because they finished the song, the two of them, okay. that day. And I think as a, I don't know, a tribute slash marketing move, the, the, Yoko released the very song, the last song that he worked on, you know? And it's it's not a bad song. I mean, it, it definitely has her screaming, but it's in the background, and mm. it has a melody, and she sings the melody in her weird way, but it's, you know, it's artsy, and it's... But it's it's a it's kind of a jam. It's new wavy, um, and uh, the video for it is interesting. It has scenes from them in New York City. Uh, there's a long scene of the two of them naked having sex. By the way, <laughs> like soft core porn, hmm. um, which is interesting. Anyway, so um, they really that, wanted the world to know that they were a couple. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Mar uh, the killer and the photographer wait outside his door all day and night and the photographer was going to leave around dinner time and the killer said um, I don't know if you should leave because you might not ever see him again he said uh, yeah. he said that yeah and the photographer's like huh and according to the killer later he said that he didn't want the photographer to leave because there was a part of him that wanted an excuse not to kill John Oh, so the time he said that the adult in him was saying, go home, the phony, if you will, was saying, go home, just get yeah. on a plane, fly back home. But he also said the inner child in him was saying, he's mine. I want this. I want to be somebody and devil, please help me kill John, right. which is starting to sound psychotic, right? Like, yeah. I want to be somebody. He's mine. Devil help me. It, it doesn't yeah. sound like regular inner speak, right? Yeah. All right. 1045. And you just have to wonder. It's like if, if the killer had just, at, you know, 1030 had just gone home. It's like, well, geez, yeah. 10, 1030. Like <laughs> I've, I've, waited been, long I've been waiting here since, you know, eight in the morning. Um, limo pulls up 1045. And Yoko gets out, walks past the killer. John is 20 feet behind Yoko. They're walking into the building. And John walked past Mark, kind of looked at him, looked at the killer. And according to the killer, he's seen like, I think he recognized me from earlier in the day. And as John passes, the killer crouched down, like in a police kneeling, mm -hmm. shooting position to get a good, you know, solid stance shot John um, five times in the back just as he was taught because um, the killer took shooting classes and learned just point at the center of mass and pull the trigger Great. and uh, John was uh, hit four times and John fled inside the building and collapsed and the four bullets punctured his left lung and severed his subclavian artery Ugh. because it took a while for him to get to the hospital because uh, medical response was extremely slow. I think in general in New York city at the time. And there was this huge debate as to, you know, if they could have saved him, but according to experts, there's no, even if uh, an ambulance was right there and took him to the hospital, he still would have died because there was yeah. too much blood loss and he Yoko uh, was over him trying to stop the bleeding. The killer just stood there. And the doorman, who was a good friend 
of John and Yoko and had gotten to know the killer because the killer was standing right there. But the doorman stands in this little security box yeah. near the front. And the doorman was crying and yelling and ran up to the killer and grabbed him and said, what, you know, what did you do? What, what are you doing? And the shaking uh, caused the killer to drop his gun. And the killer was anxious and, and just waiting, you know, with his catcher in the rye. And he was pacing, waiting for the police to arrive. And he was reading the book, Catcher in the Rye. And the police got there, uh, took him into custody, and they actually, actually transported John to the hospital. Hmm. Because I think, again, because the ambulance was not likely to arrive. At the hospital, John didn't have a pulse. They opened up his chest wide and massaged his heart. The doctor actually tried to pump his heart with his own hand yeah. to get it working. It didn't work. As the doctor came out to tell Yoko that John was dead, on the Muzak was All My Lovin', the Beatles song. Oh, jeez. That night, it was a Monday night. During Monday night football, Tom Brokaw broke a special announcement, which is, you know, saying something about That's the importance huge. of this. huge. Um, interrupting, you know, back then, Monday Night Football was watched by 75% of households. Yeah. Tom Brokaw said that John Lennon had been killed. He was cremated soon after and uh, spread ashes and right across the street in Central Park where the memorial would be later. And there was a 10 minutes of silence asked by Yoko, radio stations around the country, maybe all over the world, recognize this 10 minutes of silence. Um, so it was, um, you know, it was a vigils and crying and it was a huge deal. Um, and I don't know if we'll ever have a figure that so many people will know of. I mean, John Lennon was known all over the world, right? I guess when Michael Jackson died, it, it was a, it's a yeah. similar kind of feeling of, um, global pain to some extent. So um, have you seen the interview where they talked to Paul that day, that Monday and ask him what he thinks about John's death? Uh, I think I've seen it. Yeah. Uh, Do you, but, but I don't remember exactly what he says. Well, so it's interesting to watch because it looks like Paul is like coming out of um, some building somewhere and there's a huge, there's a bunch of paparazzi news crews and they're just like, you know, what do you think? You know, comment. And Paul, if you didn't know who Paul or John w were, you would think that Paul was talking about some old, old friend that he barely knew, or maybe even someone he didn't know. And he, he's being, he's not saying much. He's just like, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And it's shocking. And then um, they keep asking him, trying to get some reaction out of him. And he's like, um, yeah, it's, it's a drag, isn't it? And he's like, okay, I got to go. And so that became the tabloid yeah. headline, yeah, which I, was I remember seeing that. <laughs> Paul doesn't care that John was assassinated. He right. says it's a drag, meaning like bummer. Oh, yeah, bummer that he got killed. Um, but in subsequent interviews, Paul is like, look, my best friend and brother was was murdered. He didn't yeah. just die of cancer. He was murdered brutally. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> like yeah, I was, like, I was in it's, utter it's, shock. You know, and yeah, all of a so sudden, it's so dumb. It's like who who owes what you owe the press some like Oscar winning performance in that moment? Yeah, get out of here. Like, right. You but shouldn't it is, even be bothering him. Yeah, but it is kind of interesting, and I think a, a comment on Paul's personality that he just kind of defaults to a a non-emotional place or something. <laughs> right. Um, and that, that is so clear in, um, get back that even in the heated moments, he's not heated. <laughs> right. He's, he, he, you know, he can be unknowingly, um, passive aggressive and <laughs> sarcastic right. and stuff, but he never is like, but he, he doesn't gosh, cool. darn it. You guys, we got to really get our ass together here. Nothing, yeah. you know? Yeah, he's always kind of, hey, well, you know, well, how about, you know, hey, come on, you know. Exactly. Um, so, well, not exactly, but <laughs> with my accent. You did it exactly right. Um, so, 
the killer indeed did become famous. He did become not a nobody. He was talked about and talked about and talked about, particularly back then, reverberating to now, you and I. Yeah. Um, did he get what he wanted, Berto? I don't know how he interprets it in his head. If um, at the surface level at the time, um, to some extent, but I, I, so from the interviews and from what I've seen of not only him, but others like him, um, it's clear that their pain and suffering never went away. <laughs> and I don't, you know, I don't know if, if he's had that moment of clarity ever of realizing, wow, if I just had help. You yeah, know. I know. Um, before I forget, the trauma that Yoko went, I mean, just imagine that. Jeez. You're all of a sudden, boom, 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 and your husband is being gunned down and, and bleeding out and laying there, and yeah. you're standing over him, and he's dying, and just how how traumatic that would be. I mean, it just really no, doesn't get ridiculous. any worse than that. It's like, okay, so he let's say he gets run over by a car. Like, how traumatic, tragic that is. But then on top of that, this is like this aggressive person, this entity in the world driving these, you know, metaphor daggers into him. And yeah. it's just, yeah, it's, I don't understand how someone just gets over that. Yeah. And then Sean, his child, who had been five-ish at the time. Oh knew about it you know was upstairs by the way oh. in their in their apartment um a little five-year-old yeah and then you just think about john too about the last seconds of his life just being shot and then stumbling inside and collapsing and just wondering what's going through his mind at the time right well now what i will say about those moments <laughs> not having been shot but having been in really bad accidents and stuff is uh at least for me um, there's not a lot of what one would expect, which would be like, oh God, what has happened to me? What's go-? It was like, for me, it's always been a, a lot more present in the moment. Like, oh geez. Okay. Uh, what? Okay. Like when I was my accident, when I was 18, I come to, and I'm like, oh, they're cutting me out of the car. Okay. Wait, what happened? All right. And then I started like bargaining. I'm like, oh, right. Oh, shit. I've been a bad person. I was very, you know, religious at the time. So I was like, okay, if I, if I get through this, I'm just going to really change my, you know, like that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so I don't know. It's hard to say because like, first of all, your body goes into shock. There's pain, but there's, there's also not pain. There's confusion. And he probably, if he's losing that much blood, he's instantly like dizzy and dozy. So there's probably not going to be a ton of, of conscious awareness of everything that's happening to you. Mm. Uh, which in a way is maybe a, a blessing in disguise, you know, just right, like right. maybe he just drifted off conf- in confusion and then that was it. Yeah. So there's the trial and uh, he, his defense team were building a, an argument that he was insane at the time of the trial, at the time of the, of the crime. But on the first day of his tr- trial, he changed his plea to guilty against the advice of his lawyers. Now, the question here, and you brought this up earlier, was might he not have been competent if he was delusional and wasn't right in the head? Might it have been possible that he was still not right in the head by the time the trial came around and wasn't able to make that determination of should I was because if you are delusional yeah. And you do something, and then later on you're still delusional, and you and people are saying you're delusional now, and you were delusional then. Often you're like, no, I'm not, and no, I wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> how, how dare you? I know <laughs> the little people are real. You're you're right, all right, idiots, right. <laughs> you know. And um, so, but I will say that psychiatrists at the time all found him to be competent enough to stand trial, which can be kind of a low bar at times. And I wonder if there was a bias. It's like, dude, this this guy killed John Lennon. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, do you want to be? I'm I'm not saying you personally, but who wants to be the psychiatrist to 
quote unquote, let him off easy, you know? <laughs> well, his own, t- which I'll get into, uh, his it, team. Yeah. yeah. And it, but to be clear, and I, I want everyone to hear this because it's important that everyone understand that. And your, you know, stepdad does this kind of stuff, Berto, or at least does he still he work did, at yeah. Western? State? No, no, he did. He did. He, he retired. He's retired. Um, that when you are found to be insane at the time of the crime, often the sentence, the actual sentence, the actual time you spend behind bars is longer than it would have been if you were not found to be insane at the time of the crime. So if you murder someone and you're not found to be insane at the time of the crime, you could get, you know, 15 years. Yeah. But if you're insane at the time of the crime, if it found if that's found and that's your defense and it's actually granted, then the sentence might be indefinite. Right. And right. at every step of the way, the psychiatrists have to uh, um, sign off on your release. You know, yeah. when you when you get a sentence of 15 years, it doesn't matter what state of mind you're in. You just get released. But when you're insane at the time of the crime, you're determined to be a danger to society based on, on your mental illness. And to be released, a psychiatrist or a, an evaluator has to determine that you're safe. They have to do tests on you. And what psychiatrist, what evaluator wants to put their signature on a line saying, yes, this person will not murder people. Right, right. No one wants to say that. <laughs> you know, it's so much easier to say, well, I don't know. I mean, there's some indications that he yeah. might actually murder people. So a lot of people who get insane at the time of the crime granted stay in prison the rest of their life, even yeah. though they would have only spent 10 or 15 years. So it's not getting off easy. Right, <laughs> no, and I, I, I don't, like I have uh, the the sort of the opposite perspective that uh, I think the system shouldn't actually have these either or things. Like I think everyone is essentially in a state of mental uh, aberration when they commit crimes. And I don't mean like they're psychotic or anything. I just mean that if you have a, a Pareto distribution of what humans do on a daily basis, anyone who is outside of that distribution is already acting, in my opinion, uh, outside of the norm that we want, and therefore all of them need help to more extent some others uh, some need a lot more help and things like that so I get that, but i'm just I was just kind of more saying it tongue in cheek that like at the time, if it comes out that oh yeah, the John Lennon's killer, this one psychiatrist on the stand said that he was not competent to stand trial, that person would probably be a bit you know fearful of the reaction, yeah. Um, I'll also say that some people will be found insane at the time of the crime will get sufficient treatment or demonstrate such that they will be released much earlier than their sentence would have yeah. done. Um, and if you knew those situations, you would find them to be quite just because there are situations where people can become temporarily insane according to the law and do yeah. things they would never do normally. And once they're treated effectively and monitored that they stay on treatment, there's no risk or very low risk of them doing anything like that. So um, the system, uh, I guess, works sometimes in those situations. Anyway, yeah. He was sentenced to 20 years to life, um, which I'm not exactly sure what that means. He, he's still in prison as of now, which is 32 years or you know 30 years later after his sentencing. Um. He, some details about his prison life, he was confined to a special handling unit because they worried that people were going to kill him because there were so many fans of John Lennon in prison. He fasted for a month in 1982, so the government force-fed him. He, by the way, over time, has is allowed one conjugal visit per year with his wife for 48 hours in a special prison home. Uh, Gloria uh, stayed married to him and they currently as of 2022 still run a prison ministry in wow. the prison uh, he had his first parole hearing at, at about 20 years at the, in the year 2000 and he said he was not a danger to, to society and that John Lennon would have approved of his release <laughs> The parole board concluded that releasing him would deprecate the seriousness of the crime and serve to undermine a respect for the law. 
and that him doing media interviews while in prison represented a continued interest to maintain his notoriety, which was a risk of bad things happening once released. And as I said, 2022, August this year, he is supposed to have his 12th parole hearing. Should he be paroled, Berto? What do you think? Yeah, that's... uh, So, since he has received no cure, as far as we know... (laughs) um, and there's a lot of indication that he he has mental uh, issues. Uh, I I don't know how anyone could say, oh yeah yeah no he's he's good to go. Uh, now I understand that that's not how it works when you're serving time, but since he hasn't served this time and this is more of a parole to see if he's maybe eligible to get let out early. Uh, me personally, no hell no, <laughs> I wouldn't do it. Um, I mean, that that seems like a risk. I think that he should be evaluated i again i i think it's really odd but i understand why because our our science is in its infancy in so many ways how we treat some some actions of the brain as um you know fully in control and others not fully in control and and of course there's extremes that make it very easy to do that because if the guy that got the spike through the head and all of a sudden they their personality changes and they do weird things you're like oh yeah well look there's a spike in his head so you know, let's just remove the spike and see what happens. Yeah. Um, but in this case, I just think it's not like it's not like he went through treatment and therapy and all these things, and there's um, and he served his time. No, none of that is the case. And so, a uh, life was denied because of his situation, and so I, I don't feel compelled to you know put other lives at risk. Yeah. I go back and forth on things. By the way, Yoko says, no, he should not be paroled. But I go back and forth on this. Sometimes I feel like, well, if the risk is low, and it's pretty uncommon for someone like this to come out and kill again, because he's not like a murderer, really. I mean, he's a guy who murdered, but presumably he's not likely to fall back into that mind space again and if and as long as you had a team around him they would be able to catch the early signs so on one hand i'm like we don't need to be draconian especially as americans and constantly uh, look to prison as a solution for everything on the other hand most people 99 point some percent of people never pull that trigger and i feel like if you're going to pull that trigger and we catch you then goodbye (laughs) like you no longer deserve a place in this society you could have chosen not to do it you knew the consequences and uh even if it's draconian or even if we don't even recognize the fact that risk no longer exists i don't care screw you so i don't know which side i I, I go to both sides i don't know i don't know where i am in this moment i'm on more of the latter although slight slightly different I guess, ultimate attitude about it in the sense that I say uh, we have enough problems to deal. It's very similar. Like we have enough problems to deal with. And yes, it's costing us money to have you in jail. But honestly, I'd rather pay that cost than, uh, look, if I could wave a magic wand, what I would do is like, hey, let's figure out um, how to cure his brain permanently and and reverse the damage okay boom wave the magic wand okay good okay now let's let him out let's have him have the remainder of his life however even in that scenario i kind of need the magic wand to also wave it over everyone else's brain so that they don't get influenced by the fact that this person apparently got away with it Mm -hmm. in the end right and and that's another risk too it's like imagine the the cult hero status or the thing and so i kind of we don't live in that world we don't have those magic wands And so in the interest of society, I would say, no, yeah, I'm more on your side. Like, look, it sucks for you and for everyone involved because you had weird things happening in your brain, but it happened. And now we guys, we just got to, short of putting you to sleep, we're going to just keep you away from society. And that's what we're going to do. Yeah. And my feelings about this are pretty strong in that it's one thing to be drunk at a bar and someone pushes you and you get into a fight and someone falls on their head and they die or something. Obviously not good, but it's not a thing to, for months, plan, yeah. I'm going to kill that person. At any point yeah. in time, you go, eh, no, or maybe I should get help, or just there's so many different reasons to not do it. He had to go through so much effort 
to make this happen, uh, premeditated, first degree. And I'm like, no, like, uh, it wasn't a, a fleeting moment. It wasn't accidental. It wasn't um, a, a crime of passion. Like, you made a choice. And these kinds of, and really, my ranking is violent crimes are at the top. And, you know, drug crimes shouldn't even be crimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, uh, shoplifting, okay, maybe just above that bottom level. Breaking yeah. into someone's home, pretty high up there. You know, things yeah. that make us feel unsafe physically, yeah. I consider to be, you know, top of the heap in terms of what is egregious to society and should be massively punished. Unfortunately, that's not how our system works. I mean, there are people that just sold drugs three times and now they're in prison the rest of their life. It's just like, what? Right, right. Now, and by the way, and uh, and this is really hard too, because for me, it's not even about punishing. Uh, it's again about, I, I'm removing you from society because I don't want to deal, I don't yeah. even want to take the chance. Like, totally, just, that's, that's a part of what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, because there, there's other, and I used to be like this for sure. There's another, which is the punitive, like, no, uh-uh. I mean, we should put him to death or we should torture him or stuff. Look, I've I've been in that boat mentally so much for so many years um, of how can we get back at evil people? Uh, but it's just pointless. It's sadly, it's just, or I don't know if it's sadly, it's just pointless. That's not the way the universe works. No one is better for it. They don't get cured. You know, their suffering does nothing for any of us. <laughs> so I would much rather have just like that removal. Like, look, you're removed from society. This is unfortunate for everyone involved. We're just removing you from society. Yeah, Berta, what is it about Beatles topics that make us go extremely long? We're almost at three hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's. We are fascinated by it, but it also has influenced our whole culture for several groups of generations, and mm -hmm. and this one on top of it. Uh, relates to all the psychology aspects and so right and, I, and like i said i think there's a there's a lot of details that that i think are interesting Absolutely. You know, I, I don't think there's been a slow moment of this discussion no. according to me anyway um also what he said in interviews he says he takes full responsibility for killing john lennon he doesn't he you know doesn't blame anyone he says quote at the time john lennon was a two-dimensional celebrity he was just an album cover to me which is interesting. I think he's saying, I didn't really realize he was a human being with feelings and, you know. Um, he said controversy, he said contradictory things about the role the book had, Catcher in the Rye, on the murder. He often said that he killed John to promote the book. But in the end, he said the book did not cause him to kill John Lennon. And he actually, because of uh, the... Because this, this was such a famous murder and Catra, you know, I bet you anything, if you ask someone in 1983, why did he kill John Lennon? They would say Catra in the Rye. That, that, mm -hmm. that's, that's all they'd say. Because that, that was the tagline that people walked away from. And he actually, the killer, wrote the author, J.D. Salinger, to apologize, I think, for associating his book with murder and crime. Because he liked the books, he, he he really did like it, and he was sorry that he had, you know, besmirched it. <laughs> he he seems to be slightly psychotic in the later interviews, which is interesting. Mm. He continued to believe that John knew. Was that yeah. an excuse, a way of denial, or is that a evidence of his slight psychosis? I say slight because you know there's full blown where it's just like I'm Jesus and uh, right. But, it, but you, you know, the, the next question is like, okay, so let's say he did. What does that mean for us? <laughs> like, let's walk through this. Is that supposed to make it okay? Or right. is that supposed to be some proof that there was a grander design that yeah. you were just an unwitting right. participant with? Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's his delusion from the beginning yeah. is like, there's something wrong in the world. There's something, you know, right. rotten in Denmark. And if I kill this person, it will solve that problem. Yeah. And John both knows and agrees with it and is willing to sacrifice himself for the greater good of 
the wrong being righted. Now, of course, from the outside, you're like, what are you talking about? What wrong are you talking about? But to the deluded, to the psychotic, it makes total sense. It's very, very consistent with some underlying idea. Um, Which is also consistent with psychotic people that when you actually start asking them questions like, well, what do you what do you mean by that? They don't, you know, the uh, often what people think is they have this elaborate story of like, well, there's the cosmic rays that cause a lot of times they don't have anything. You know, it, it feels right to them, but they have no story it's it can often it be, just it, is yeah yeah it just is of course yeah. killing john no, solved I've, the I've experienced that um it, and i've been surprised by what you're saying just talking with someone like that where i am expecting okay here we go let's hear it let's hear the explanation and there right. isn't right yeah right instead of hearing like well there's an elaborate illuminati and this person paid off this person and that's why we see that you know it's just like well no no that's just it just is you know uh, we're all I was meant to do it yeah, and yeah. Uh, Hillary is a lizard person, and yeah. what do you mean? It's just well, where where are they from? It, well, what do you mean? They're just they're lizard demon. Well, are they demon people or lizard people? And do they want to? Yeah. Anyway, so um, <laughs> he said he merged with Holden in later interviews because I don't know, maybe because yeah. he hated himself or he saw Holden as like. A special maybe because he, Holden's in a book that that makes him special and he, to attach himself to that. By the way, you know from Mindhunter, the main character Holden mm. Ford was named after Holden. Holden, yeah. Holden <laughs> um, he says, "Quote: At the time, I never learned how to let my feelings of anger let out my feelings of anger and rage, and I saw myself as a failure." So later on, he is able to reflect and say, "I." needed some way to let out my feelings of anger and rage other than to kill John Lennon. I had no way of doing it. So if we take that, and I think that's, I think that's important because I think this is also a common, you know, a big part of why I want to talk about this is so that we can prevent this from happening in the future. I think that's the best thing yeah. you can do this, you can use this for. And if we can help people with their feelings of anger and rage and whatever feeling, anger and rage, whatever feelings they have, then <clears throat> we might be able to, among all those all that help that we can give young people, some of them we might prevent from murder because we can imagine the killer as a kid feeling traumatized, feeling hurt, feeling anger, um, and not having a family that will listen to it and not having enough self-knowledge or awareness to know that he needs to talk about it. And by the time he's 25, it's all just boiled up and he decides to kill John Lennon. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, and that and that's a that's a great thing to teach and and educate kids about that because yeah, I mean think about it like you're growing up and whatever your background is, th- there's no at no point traditional in traditional education traditional systems at no point are you aware that if if you're feeling wrong in your head or if you're, you're feeling weird feelings that there's something you can do about it other that you might need to do about it it's always like well sure my the medical part is there like okay my tooth is hurting my my ankle just twisted um and the academic part is there like oh i'm doing poorly with my studies i need to get a tutor or whatever uh but it, it's like if you're if you're like oh, i'm feeling like i need to kill myself or i need to kill john lennon where is the pattern that you're supposed to follow <laughs> What is the thing you're supposed to do? Or how do you even know that you're supposed to do something about it? And so... Right. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And uh, we could end so many things, you know, a thousand things, one of which is random murder, but so many other problems we can solve if we can help people with this. And sometimes that means it has to come from the outside. It can't come from inside the family because of the cycle of trauma you know, because I'm guessing your dad went through some stuff when he was a kid, right? Right. And they went through stuff when they were kids. And so it it sometimes requires an outside element, like a therapist or someone, a teacher or a school counselor or something, uh, an aunt, somebody. Um, so in Central Park, there's a 
Memorial, Strawberry Fields, across from the Dakota, where Yoko spread his ashes. Yoko requested that it not be a statue, but a living memorial. And that's why it's that... Have you ever been there before? When I was little, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I've been there recently, and it's great. There's always fans. There's always someone singing Beatles songs or John songs. And fans come. I mean, so so I actually I don't know if it was there when. What, do you do you know how soon after it was put there? Mid eighties. So I actually know. So then I probably wouldn't have been because, I I I was there. Okay, I was there as an adult in two thousand one, but as a kid, I was in New York. Wait, before nine eleven, you were in New York. No, uh, two thousand two. Sorry, did I say two? What did I say? Two thousand one. Yeah. No, I meant two thousand two. Oh, I was right after nine eleven. And I went to Central Park. I, I went to a, a whole bunch of places that I remembered as a kid, including Central Park. And you didn't go to um, the Imagine thing. To the what? The Strawberry Fields. It says Imagine in in mosaic on the ground. I I, I saw that in 2002. But I, oh, I was did. saying that I thought that I had seen it as a kid, but I wouldn't have because when I was a kid in New York, it was like 80, 80 and 81. It yeah. was, yeah, it was right after he had been killed, basically. Right. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah. constructed till mid 80s like 84 yeah. 85 so, so i've only congreg- seen it once congregate there on john's birthday and on his death day and um yeah it's it's a great thing and i if yoko had a big part in the design i think it's great yeah because if it was a statue yeah that would have been um not as fitting so i'm as i'm talking now Berto, i think i'm going to make this into a two-parter <laughs> 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 uh, just because it's like Really? Like three hours? I mean, get back. It's like a eh, two-parter, but I think this deserves a two-parter episode. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so getting into the professional opinions of, well, actually, along those lines, let's take a break. This will be like our break from the second part, okay? <laughs> okay. All right, so we're back from the break. Let's talk about the professional opinions about the murderer and what they thought he was, what what they thought his psychology entailed. More than a dozen psychologists and psychiatrists interviewed the murderer before his trial, and many others have commented on him afterwards, many other experts, because it's a you know, oft-talked-about thing. So mainly what they were trying to do before the trial was to determine if he was insane at the time of the crime, as we've been talking about. And usually what they're trying to determine, and I actually studied... I. Uh, in my doctorate, I specialized in forensic psychology and I was trained to do this work, but it was a while ago and I never actually did the work as a profession. And so some of my wording might be a little funny, but there was a time when I'd be able to rattle this off off the top of my head because I was often quizzed on it. But anyway, essentially the assessors are trying to figure out if one, the person has a mental illness, because if you have to have a mental illness to qualify for insane mm-hmm. at the time of the crime. It has to be a DSM diagnosis. So do you have a mental illness? And two, does that, does that mental illness impair your ability to know right from wrong? Right. Does it impair your ability to appreciate the consequences of your actions? Does it, you know, does it impair your ability to know what you're even doing? So those two things have to coincide. You can't have a mental illness. You can't be depressed, but also... Uh, have it, it, the way it goes is you have to have a mental illness and that mental illness has to impair something about your ability to detect right from wrong, know what you're doing. So for example, if you have a delusion that guns will actually save people and people have delusions of that sort and you shoot someone, you, you don't know you're killing them. You, you think you're actually curing some spiritual disease. Like you, you can have a delusion like that. Right. So in that instance, if it were true or found to be true, then you were insane at the time of the crime. You didn't understand what you were doing. You you didn't understand it was murder. You thought you were yeah. saving people. Um, or if you had a delusion that the victim will come back to life, like if John Lennon would be you know become a phoenix and then make a, the best rock god album of all time. If you literally believe that, you do not understand the consequences. You know you're murdering someone, but you don't understand what that means. You know. Or seems some people... A, that one seems a little hard to prove. <laughs> yeah. Well, but people do. You know, you, yeah, you, yeah. You, there are tests and ways of yeah. determining. 
And sometimes when you're psychotic, you're you can or you have another condition, you can be extremely confused about what's happening. Like you just have no logic and you just like gun shoot and you don't really get it. And so that can also be uh, if found to be um, demonstrable, then you could be found insane at the time of the crime. The defense experts, so you, you typically you have independent experts, defense experts, and prosecution experts. And the defense experts, where do you think they, they all unanimously found one thing, Berto. What do you think they found? Um, and the, um, they were the question as to whether or not he was insane at the time of the crime. Yeah, he probably was insane. Yeah, all six defense yeah. experts concluded that the murderer was psychotic at the time of the crime and we've reviewed that evidence you know there's the little right. people and the john new and um i am holden caulfield that kind of thing yeah um the specific diagnoses were five diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia full-blown paranoid schizophrenia and there's you know there's a case for that one diagnosed him with manic depression what's called bipolar now i think maybe they would have said schizoaffective in today's language i'm not quite sure but and as i said earlier the killer was combative with the defense experts mm -hmm. and because he didn't want to be called crazy and in the end he just threw everything out and said you're not gonna we're not gonna have a trial i just i'm just gonna plead guilty and not insane at the time of the crime um but so that one's a little puzzling to me i i, I didn't know that was possible like <laughs> how do you protect someone who is not fit to stand trial and who like like let's say someone visibly psychotic at all times but they managed to say like these people don't represent me they are demons well, from the underworld blah 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 well because you know? there's there's two questions mainly in these situations one is insane at the time of the crime and the other one is competent to stand trial right and from my they didn't talk about this very much because it wasn't a central question, but I'm, uh, I'm guessing that they found him to be competent to stand trial. And so if you're competent to stand trial, then often you're competent enough to make your own plea. And, um, and I don't know what arrangement they had. I mean, the lawyers might have been like, well, if he's going to fight us the whole way, then we might as well go along with him. And we can't really demonstrate that he's not. It's and, just, and, it just seems like one of those like, my lawyers and defense psychiatrists are saying that I was uh, insane at the time of the crime, uh, but I wasn't, and they are demons from the underworld. So I guess if I say that they're demons from the underworld, maybe I won't be fit to stand trial. Right. And then That's maybe not what he was saying. He was saying, <laughs> right. I, I might have some issues, but I was doing it of my own yeah. free will and that kind of... And it's, yeah. you know, it's debatable. I think there's a debate there because... Yeah there's some signs that he continues to suffer from psychosis and um, might not really understand. And if proper treatment happened, maybe he'd be like, actually, I probably should have been uh, argued that I wasn't quite right in the head at the time. Yeah. Um, the prosecution experts, Berto, what do you think they concluded? That he was sane at the time of the crime. Right. They all unanimously really? said to a he, he is not psychotic. This doesn't call into question the whole shenanigans <laughs> yeah so when i was getting my forensic degree oh god i would sometimes bring this up i would say well isn't it like aren't Odd. isn't bias a part of this you know the person <laughs> that's hiring you and the, unanimously every because the teachers and the experts were all they all did this sort of work in fact, one of my teachers we had on this podcast years and years ago, Dr. Manley, who was mm -hmm. uh, the evaluator of that guy who killed his kids in Tacoma and himself, burned the house down, remember? Yeah, um, I remember that horse. And uh, what was his name? I can't remember. Josh something. Um, and uh, I would ask that question. I'd be like, because um, as a therapist, a big focus is bias and understanding your own motivations and, and never assuming that you're rational and that you're objective. But yeah. forensic psychology is completely dependent on the delusion that they are objective observers. <laughs> and yet when you look at case after case after case, 
and it isn't always the case. Well, you but should just often, be able to statistically look at it, and if you know, it, and it, it's true. It, yeah, <laughs> it's true that if you're called by the prosecution and say they're like, we want you to evaluate this, the defendant to see if they're insane at the time of the crime. Statistically, it's shown that a majority of the time you will side with what you imagine the prosecution yeah. and maybe it's an unconscious bias maybe it's i don't know but yeah. um in this instance we have that and I, I would bring that up in class and i would always get no 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 this is objective and i'd be like <laughs> no i don't think you understand like there's all there's, there's bias something called and, statistics <laughs> and yeah and, and they'd be like no 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 um uh, and i would ask I would, i'd be like well when you get hired by the prosecution do you ever da 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 and they're like no i'm, I'm always honest and i'm like in my head, I wanted to say, well, then how do you still have a job? Because yeah. for sure, the prosecution is not going to hire you if every time you go against their ruling, they can choose from anyone they want to hire. I know, I know. It's, and, it's not only the, right, because the bias is not only the, the therapist, the, the forensic person, it's also the prosecution's bias. Right. Because when you- of who the, they hire. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah. And of course, when you ask the lawyers, they all have, oh, no, definitely he was not psychotic. I mean, why isn't it just the court then? Well, so the court appointed lawyers also will independently evaluate him. And they found him to be competent to stand trial. I, I, I forgot. I actually had that in my notes. And they actually agreed with the, with the, with the uh, prosecution's experts. Now, the court has a, you know, their buddy-buddy with the prosecutor. So they're yeah. more likely to do that. But, and that's a high-profile trial. Right. And that, so that's the other thing is that, you know, was the OJ trial unbiased, partial, impartial, you know, it's like, right. So the, um, finding which they thought was that he wasn't, although he might've been slightly delusional, they did, they did agree with that, but they said he was not full blown schizophrenic or psychotic, which I kind of agree with that. Yeah. Um, he, he's slightly delusional, but not completely. And there are plenty of people who make these kinds of uh, crimes that do these kinds of things who are not delusional at the time. You know, the um, guy in Connecticut, the guy in California, the guy in Las Vegas, you know, they're not delusional. They're just extremely angry and they're distorted and they're making some really bad choices and they're desperate, but they're not, they understand what they're doing. The murderer of John Lennon knew I am going to kill this man because he is a symbol of phoniness and he deserves to die because he claims to be a, a, a leader of the people, but he is one of the man. He is one of the rich and he deserves to die. That's, you know, you could say it's informed by psychosis, but it's not, consumed or completely caused by it you know what i mean i think that's the argument that they were making and that that seems from my very distant point of view that seems like a credible believable argument you know what i mean i i do at the same time it's it, again it, these boundaries are so squishy right because if if we are to believe that basically um he was fit to stand trial and fit when he committed the crime um then, you know, he could come to another rationalization later about why someone else needs to die. And so I think we should probably keep him in jail for a life sentence. Right. Because... And so that, that's, why they, <laughs> that's why they haven't let him out is because right, right, right. they consider the prosecution and apparently the parole board and maybe the current uh, psychiatric team believe that narcissism is the cause. That uh, there are certain versions of narcissism, the Charlie Manson kind, the Ted Bundy kind, that causes you to want to eliminate people, you know, yeah. that you feel superior and lack of empathy to the point where you're just like, I'm going to take that person out because they're in my way and I deserve it. I'm entitled. Right. And it's not, it's not narcissistic personality disorder, but it's a, it's a, uh, psychopathic narcissism that drives people sometimes. And, you know, that's the argument also that I've been kind of making is like his extreme worthlessness. And then the mom saying you're going to be special. And then this drive throughout life of like, 
um, I'm going to, I need to be worshiped. I need to be somebody. I need to, I need to make a name for myself and the desperation thereof. And that, that yeah. struggle between worthlessness and grandiosity uh, resulted in a desperate act of like, well, if I kill this person, I'll both get my anger out and I will be somebody. People will and know I, who I am. Right. And, and I will say like, none of the evidence points to, uh, for example, that at the time of the crime, he thought he was holding, you know, a pen for an autograph, and he thought that John right. Lennon was actually Ringo Starr. And, like, none of the evidence points to that, which is a complete diso- diso- disassociation from what's actually visibly and, and auditorily in front of him. Um, so you could make the claim that, well, no, no I mean, he, he, he had some definitely ideas that were not uh, standard and were informed by some of these delusions and things but in the moment he knew that that was john lennon that this was a gun and that that would kill him right and so i could see that angle um from the from the prosecution right and you know a common thing you'll hear from people that are found to be insane at the time of the crime is he's in the library and he's looking at the book and he sees his father instead of john lennon and yeah. it's not it's like john he knows everyone thinks that's john lennon but it's actually yeah. his father and right. so he drives to new york and kills him because he's trying to kill his father you know that and if that were true then yeah. that's obviously like whoa you're delusional that doesn't make any sense um so i i was thinking as i was uh, watching the documentaries and researching how similar the killer of john lennon was to other kind of killers that are famous uh for example charlie manson as i mentioned was also obsessed with the Beatles, was also a musician, also trying to make it, also writing music, yeah. also narcissistic, also very opinionated, um, but very different in that the the guy who killed John Lennon doesn't talk like Charlie Manson. You yeah. know, Manson had this very charismatic, uh, frantic way of talking uh, and was a cult leader, <laughs> whereas the guy who killed John Lennon was a, was a almost like a cult follower and also a, a loner. Right. Oh, and Manson did have the layers upon layers upon layers about what reality really is. Meaning, you know, he did have the conspiracy theories. He did have the. Um, well, he wasn't psychotic. He just had a Manson just had a very elaborate point of view that was actually kind of shared by a lot of people at the time. You know, I was talking about the the terrorism on the left that was at the right. time, and, and he he had a similar thing of like. But, yeah. The race war and all that stuff. That's what I mean, because earlier you were saying that normally psychotics don't have oh, that. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Manson did have that. They, he had yeah. the layers of explanations about this and that and the other thing and right. how this was influencing that. And like, um, yeah. Now, one could argue that Manson did have slight psychosis similar to the killer of John Lennon in that he believed that the Beatles were speaking to him particularly, I think, or at least the people saying, rise up and kill the piggies um anyway. you know th- but i so i struggle with those because so on the other hand are you on a regular basis you have people yeah. all across this country claiming that they are hearing the voice of god that they're speaking in tongues that they were told explicitly something about the president or about whoever or about, like this happens on a regular basis and no right. one's calling them psychotic Right. It's because, and it's explicit in the DSM that it has to, it can't be something that's culturally normal. And if you're in a certain echo chamber on the internet, then you believe Hillary Clinton is a lizard person and it doesn't make you delusional. Um, But anyway, um, so there's some similarities there. Uh, The Vegas killer. Uh, With the Vegas killer, similarly, there didn't seem to be anything out of the ordinary. No one thought, well, that guy's going to kill someone. But quietly depressed and possibly angry at the world believed the government was, you know, he was railing about the government trying to take his guns and life wasn't going according to his plan. He was suicidal. Also married to an Asian American woman, which is interesting. The killer in California, in uh, University of California, San something, (laughs) can't remember. Um, Quietly angry at the world, suicidal. Also, dad married an Asian woman. (laughs) Just just another detail there. Um, Reagan shooter, he was actually in the crowd at the vigil outside the Dakota when they were mourning wow. John Lennon. And four months later, he shot President Reagan. Ugh. Police found a, ca- a copy of Catcher in the Rye among his personal belongings. And 
he left a cassette in his hotel room about uh, John Lennon, and it said, one of my idols was murdered, meaning John Lennon, and now Jodie Foster is the only one left. Because the Reagan shooter was, he wanted to kill Jodie Foster because he was obsessed with Jodie Foster and, of course, the taxi driver uh, yeah. connection. But in, And he really identified with Holden Caulfield, but he decided to kill President Reagan instead. And remember that for the John Lennon murder, he, President Reagan yeah. was on his, list, on his list too. Yeah. So a lot of similarities there. And again, we can see the, the Joker, the movie, um, you know, these kinds of um, uh, angst manifesting in, in that way. I hadn't thought about that. Joker, the movie, is kind of in line with Taxi Driver, Holden oh, Caulfield. Oh, course. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it is that same archetype. Right. For sure. So here's my conceptualization. I'm finally going to end with this. And I've already kind of gone over this, but just to systematically discuss it. So I think that mild psychosis played a role. He was prone to psychotic notions. I am Holden Caulfield, the little people. He, uh, but he wasn't, you know, moderate to severe. It was mild because it wasn't a classic presentation. It wasn't ruining his life. It was just kind of there in the background and it would become exacerbated when he would become stressed and maybe getting a little worse into his 20s, which, which can happen. And this is something that I didn't know until I became a therapist, that there are a lot of people out there in the same way that you can have people with full-blown depression and then a lot of mm -hmm. mildly depressed people. You have full-blown delusional, schizophrenic, schizoaffective people, but then there's a lot of people that are under the, under the threshold and mm -hmm. function pretty well in life. They have jobs, they have families. But when you talk to them, you realize, oh, you have a portion of your belief system or how you see the world, you're, you, you, you don't see things the way normal people do. You seem kind of out of touch with reality. You seem kind of in this magical thinking world, and especially if they're in a world of religion or, you know, the... Well, that's, the, that's the what Q I was Anonymous bringing world. up. Like, I, I know people both on the ghost side of things, on the alien side of things on the uh, religion side of things, that fully and regularly and constantly express their experiences as being extremely real and many of these experiences about these other worlds. Right. And when you talk to them, they seem otherwise normal, except if it comes to that topic, it's like, oh yeah, I've seen ghosts. Oh, really? Oh yeah, yeah, no. And then they'll have a range of stories about all the ghost encounters they've had throughout right. the years. And then same thing with aliens. Oh, yeah, no, I, I've seen it. And then same thing with the religious thing. Like, no, I, I fully speak in tongues. Uh, actually, I saw my, my, my uncle. I've laid hands. His, his hips were healed. I, I regularly hear the voices. and the, Like, this happens. This is right. real. Right. And for some of them, they're just really into the religion and just really convinced. But some of them, you know, if we stripped away culture, they would still they would have their mild psychosis would manifest somehow, you know, like the squirrels were talking to them or something, yeah. but you give them a venue that accepts their delusions. Then they seem normal and they fit in, you know, yeah. might even be encouraged. And so there's a lot of people like that. And that explains a lot to me. <laughs> About yeah, <laughs> the QAnon thing and about other kinds of ideas that I'm like, how really that? I mean, I understand being suspicious of the Democrats or you know, or a certain political party, but that far lizard yeah, people, right, yeah. you know, the you're extracting the thing, and I don't under, like Tom Hanks really. So now, what percentage? I don't know, but there's a percentage and. I we always have this thought of this dichotomy of like, well, if you're schizophrenic, you're ranting and raving, you're in a yeah. hospital or you're homeless or, you know, there's something noticeably, quote unquote, crazy about you. But I would venture to say that the vast majority of people that suffer from mild to moderate psychosis are living completely regular lives. So yeah. um, might the murder of John Lennon been one of those people? I think there's some signs. Also, depression played a role. He seriously attempted suicide more than once. He had deep self-hatred. He was easily demoralized and very angry and irritable, which is a sign of depression. Maybe it's trauma-induced depression. 
he had that also played a role. Also, suicidal anger played a role, stemming from his depression and demoralization, similar to today's mass shooters, which I think is an important element that we really have to focus on of these, a lot of the mass shooters, they begin as suicidal and then they become mm. homicidal. Yeah. Which was very yeah. true for the murder of John Lennon. He, he did not want to kill John Lennon and then want to kill himself. He wanted to kill himself, tried to kill himself. Yeah. And decided not to for various reasons, got treatment and then continued to suffer and said, okay, I might as well kill John, you know, that kind of, yeah. Narcissism played a role probably stemming from early emotional neglect, um, kept him from asking for help. People weren't acknowledging his importance and he was angry about that, angry at John Lennon for getting recognition, fixated on the notion that if he became somebody, then everyone will love him. I think that's maybe the underlying driving force is like my mom loved me because she thought I was special, that I would be special and I don't feel good. I don't feel loved. I don't feel worth anything. And maybe if I become somebody, I need to become somebody. He keeps trying to become somebody. And then you mm -hmm. become desperate. Like, well, if I shoot John Lennon, I will be somebody. And maybe the promised land is on the other side of that. And of course it's not. Right. Um, I would also say toxic masculinity played a role in society, gender, you know, gender socialization. Um, you know, there's a reason why we don't see women doing this very often. It's almost 99% of the time it's men that do this kind of thing. And men but are I wonder how much of it is the society aspect versus something also biological, chemical, mm -hmm. like uh, testosterone uh, and would that influence, w not by itself, obviously, because not every man does this, but um, just like the combination. A a or maybe it's a combination of all of the above because it's like the societal expectations plus the fact that you, that testosterone does make, if you have enough testosterone, you can feel more angry and you're depressed and you have a slight psychosis, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. And you've been taught by society, uh, even more so back then, that you can't have emotions, right. that you can't talk about your feelings, that violence is the answer, that you need to be special, you need to be, you know, somebody. Uh, what I will say is that after thinking about it and listening to all the interviews, I don't think Catcher in the Rye had anything to do with the murder of John Lennon even though I think that's the catch line, that's the tagline yeah. that people think of. Catcher in the Rye is a book that many people have read, <laughs> millions yeah. upon millions. Uh, very few of them have, you know, two people, the killer or the shooter of Reagan and the killer of John Lennon, both were very attached to this book, both very much identified with the character. But to say that the book caused it, uh, you know, doesn't make any sense. No, it's, it's, the, it's the music that the Columbine killers was listening, were listening to. It's the video game they were playing. It's the, right. it's not. <laughs> right. If Catcher in the Rye had not been written or the killer hadn't come across it, I'm sure there would have been some other book, some other inspiration that would have helped him to feel justified in doing what he was probably going to do anyway. Because Holden Caulfield in the book doesn't talk about murdering famous people. <laughs> doesn't talk about yeah. murdering anyone. It's, he's right. just railing against phonies and, yeah. and, and, and he's suffering a lot. You know, if anything, I would think Catch in the Rye would help someone like the murder of John Lennon to feel normalized a little bit. It's like, oh, I guess, man, this guy talks like I do and maybe I'm not so alone. I don't know. But yeah. um, so now as I, in conclusion, what I'll say is my conceptualization is not very satisfying because it doesn't have a, a punch, you know, because there are plenty of people with mild psychosis, plenty of people who are depressed, plenty of people who have, who have suicidal thoughts, plenty of people who are narcissistic in this way, plenty of people who have been raised by society and in, in, within gender norms, and yet very few people actually kill people. So, you know, why did this individual kill John? Why did he get so f fixated on it? I don't know. And if you ask the experts, they'll tell you an answer. He was narcissistic. Right. Uh, if you ask the defense people, oh, he was psychotic. If you ask society, they'll be like, oh, he, you know, wanted right, to be right, someone. Catcher in the right. <laughs> catcher in the right or whatever. Yeah. And and I'm like, I don't know. You know, yeah. I, the, I, uh, over the years of this podcast, you and I have looked at a lot of these individuals. And it's just, it's a huge question mark. Yeah. And I know that that is not very satisfying. I know that it, you've listened to 
three and a half hours of us yammering about this, you would hope that at the end I would have a I would have a thing like this is the cause and this is what we need to do. Right. I don't know. But, I don't know the answer. But there are a couple lines that I think we drew impl- at least implicitly in the ground. One of them is, if someone you know, someone you love, someone you know, tells you or you know visibly that they're having they're struggling, that they've thought of killing themselves or they th- they've thought of killing someone else, uh, don't dismiss it, <laughs> and and really try to if if you're in a position to do it actively, try to help get them help you know get them to get help. Because, um, you know, the odds are that that person is not going to end up going and flying to New York and killing John Lennon. Actually, the odds are pretty good that that's not going to happen. But it doesn't mean that uh, they might not try to kill themselves or they might hurt people in other ways or they might just suffer and continue suffering and continue making those around them suffer. And, uh, you know, not doing something about it is a potential really bad miss. So that's one line because you mentioned that. And... The other one is that I th- we say this a billion times, I think it just bears repeating, is uh, we shouldn't wait for like, okay, this person killed someone. Let's get them some therapy in prison. <laughs> uh, I-, I think mental health needs to be part of our education. Yeah. From the start. Yeah, uh, agreed. So in closing, uh, John Lennon being taken away from us at perhaps his second major chapter in his art and maybe happiness seeing Sean grow up, maybe reconciling with Julian and Cynthia for that matter. And from the month before the album that was released, Double Fantasy, there's so many great songs to talk about. I mean, Just Like Starting Over, such a great song. Beautiful Boy. (laughs) <laughs> Woman is such a great it's song such and a such a unique song. Woman is yeah. like, from the first chord, you're like, oh, that's woman. Like, there's yeah. no mistaking yeah. it. Um, but watching the wheels, the lyrics are just so great. And by the way, the killer uh, in an interview talks about how he loved the lyrics of the song and and was uh. were reading it before he killed it. But just to hear these lyrics, people say I'm crazy. Doing what I'm doing. Well, they give me all kinds of warnings to save me from ruin. When I say that I'm okay, well, they look at me kind of strange. Surely Mm -hmm. you're not happy now. You no longer play the game. So referring to the fact that he hasn't been recording or been a part of the limelight for the past five years. You know, you're crazy doing what you're doing. You're going to, you're going to ruin yourself. I'm just sitting here watching the reels go round and round. I, love I really that. love to watch them roll. No longer riding on the merry-go-round. I just oh. had to let it go. I mean, yeah. especially that last line, the change in the tone. I just had to let it go. Like it, yeah. It's a beautiful song, and it, it's masterful songwriting. Yeah, it really is. These four songs, chills. really. <laughs> yeah, all four of these songs are just... And I don't think... You know, I'd always liked these songs, but in reviewing for this episode, I listened to them again, and I just... I find them to be, you know, top 10 songs John ever wrote are these four songs, really. Yeah. I mean, they're so good. And the complication and the performances and the, the melodies and the vocal, and it's just so great. And then he gets killed uh, <laughs> right then. Yeah. You know, he couldn't even he perform them. You know, he couldn't. Right. Couldn't, right. Um, yeah. And the merry-go-round thing was focused on the killer because the catcher in the right ends with Holden Caulfield with his ten-year-old sister as she's going around the merry-go-round. Yeah. And he's marveling at you know her happiness and he just kind of realizes he's never going to be happy. It's a very depressing book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Catcher in the Rye, right. Merry-go-rounds have a weird uh, significance for me because I had a a really bad accident when I was little, very, very little, on a merry-go-round and it left me sort of like traumatized from merry-go-rounds. What do you mean? What happened? Um, like I fell 
it, it was one of, you know how in the seven, late 70s merry-go-rounds were metal beasts and they still are i, I don't think they no safety improved about their safety very much they always I, seem i was little i was like three or something and i fell right or maybe no littler because i don't actually yeah anyways i fell into like as it was spinning i felt into the inner part oh my god and slammed my face against the inner part of the thing and it, as it's turning and churning as it's turning it was just like uh it just left a a very bad feeling about it and i don't remember it consciously but it always left like i never liked merry-go-rounds after that <laughs> apropos of our contrasting childhoods merry-go-rounds have a wonderful connotation to me there was a merry-go-round in spokane so we would always go to spokane washington because that's where my parents grew up and all of my grandparents and cousins lived out there and we go out there every every year at least once a year and there was a merry-go-round downtown Spokane, and they had this um, uh, arm that had a ring, and if you if you these brass rings, and if you caught the brass ring, it was really hard because you, you had to really reach <laughs> for it. And you know the mega rounds moving pretty fast, and so you had to right. reach your arm out and grab the ring. You had to, you had to, and sometimes you'd miss it, you know, or sometimes you slam your hand into the arm because you'd go too far. Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes you get it just right. You, you hook your finger in there, you get the brass ring, and it's you know it's about a two inch ring. And then you would throw the ring into this clown mouth about halfway around the other side. And if oh. you made it into the clown mouth, it would set off this alarm. And so, it, and me Whoa. and my me and my siblings Pretty played elaborate. this. Yeah, I mean, when I'm eight years old, I'm like, oh, we're going to Spokane. I can't wait to go to that merry-go-round. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds awesome. Yeah, because <laughs> it does. was like a real life video game in a sense. You know? I mean, don't don't get me wrong. Like later when I was a later kid and, and early teenage years. I, I did go on plenty of merry-go-rounds and had fun, but there was always an uneasiness in the back of my head. And after, actually, as I grew older, that uneasiness grew. And so like, now when I look at a merry-go-round, it makes me feel kind of ill. <laughs> yeah. The killer. But that clown thing, you know, with the big clown mouth staring at you, that sounds great. That would help me a lot. <laughs> well, that's another difference. Like, I, I don't have... Negative the associations bad associations. with clowns. Yeah, actually, I mean. you no. Know, to be fair, I don't either. I'm sort of playing to the crowd here because most people do. But uh, these days, I grew up with clowns being fine. Clowns were fine. Cl clowns <laughs> were not talked only, about this. Clowns were not only fine when I was growing up. They were, they were the best. They yeah. were, they were. I mean, yeah. J.P. Patches here in Seattle, yeah. a beloved cre uh, creature. And um, I never character. watched it like it when it came out. I never watched that, so I never had like a weird cloud clown thing. Well, the other th the other clown that influenced, I think, began the whole thing was Poltergeist, the clown that comes out of the closet. Um, well, I guess I don't remember. I, I watched Poltergeist. I don't remember feeling like, "Ooh, clowns are scary now." No, but I think that began the okay. slide and the, the culturally for me anyway. But yeah, yeah. the killer, there's a merry-go-round in Central Park, like near the Dakota, apparently. And before killing John, he spent some time at this merry-go-round. I think it's still there. I'm not sure. But anyway, there's the hole in Caulfield, the murderer, yeah. watching the wheels go round and round, you falling into the thing, me with the brass <laughs> ring. It's all connected, Berto. It's all connected. We're all lizard people. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because... Deserve it. Deserve it.